So I'll start then with questions. Um, I would love to hear about how your father got started making baskets in the first place. Well, uh, would you like a chair? No, I'm good. A lot, uh, way back when, before the boats came from Hyannis, we went from Woods Hole, as some of you know. And it was a three hour trip. And you'd see the ladies with their dark Reyes baskets. And everybody was always fascinated by how they're made. And nobody really knew the secrets. Uh, before you go any further, could you tell about what year? Oh, we're uh, probably talking, 50s, yeah, 50, 55-ish okay. and on. So um, you'd get on the boat and you'd see the, the occasional lady because they weren't as many as, and they were beautiful with the carved ivory or, or whale tooth, which it usually ended up being. And you know, it was always, how do they do that? And one of my father's friends down here was Paul Witten, who wrote, uh, I think there's a little brochure that you have, a little book yes. here at the, at the, on, it was an interview with Reyes. So he went and interviewed Reyes and he wrote this little book with pictures and he learned the secrets. And I think the biggest secret in an Nantucket basket is the, the groove, which you all know. And, but it's, it's kind of hard to figure out that there's a groove there. So uh, Reyes showed my father, uh, well, Reyes showed Widden what he was doing. I don't think it was an official lesson that he had, but he, he showed him what he was doing and how he was doing it. And the, um, so he came to my father and my father was a machinist for General Electric and he was a very clever hand, man. He was, you know, uh, precise. And Widden was a, Paul Widden was a uh, school principal, I believe, someplace. And the, the um, so he explained roughly what was happening and my father took it from there and he started experimenting. And I think in the display out there, there's an early one of my father's baskets, which is really crude. It's wide ribs, it's round, because he had to turn his own his own mold. He carved his own little, it's a little teeny whale, I think, on it. And, and everything was uh, crude, to say the least. But he was somebody that, that with very limited basic instruction, created a basket. And then he started refining. And he, he figured out how to make molds, because there's, there's a, um, these are, this is one of his molds. There's kind of a mathematics to it, how to make an oval. And everybody that was making baskets, like Stevie Gibbs's molds were different from Paul, uh, from Jose's. Uh, actually, Jose, I think sometimes freehanded baskets. Yeah. And, you know, that's amazing. Um, but my father started making the molds and his interpretation of the mold and the percentage of, uh, of uh, you know, centerpiece to the rest of the basket was a lot different than other people. Not that one is good or one is bad, but. Um, and he came up with the, the handle, the feel appeal handle. And he started using white oak. We live up in Linfield outside of Boston in this white oak out in the woods and he would go out and cut down a tree. And he came up with the idea of freezing what he didn't use. So our family, freezer was full of oak, <laughs> you know, a few frozen peas and corn and stuff, but uh, typically there was hunks of oak in there. And uh, so it started, and then in, when I graduated from college, I finished a basket that my sister-in-law had made, had started, and then my father gave me some more stuff and I made another open basket, I think for my mother, and I learned the basics, and then I made one, you know, with a, uh, an oval with a lid, and it, it just kept going and going. And, 
as you know, as, <laughs> as you know, it's, it's kind of scary making your first basket or, you know, is this fitting right? It doesn't look good. Uh, it's, have you got the ribs too tight? Are they straight? Uh, you know, there's so many things that you worry about when you're making your first or, you know, your first 10 baskets. And then after a while, you just really don't think about it that much. It's uh, just trim, fit, so on. Uh, so that's basically how he got into it, and then I came along. And I was, uh, I was working for General Electric at the time, and I, uh, at, at when the first oil embargo hit, um, there's a few people here that are, might remember it as little children. Uh, in seven, I think it was 74, I lost my job at General Electric. And uh, I had been making baskets and coming down in the summers and selling them. I'd come down, it was a weekend hobby type thing. And I'd come down and I would sell them to gift shops. And I, I'd take that money and put it in the bank. And uh, so it, I was making them and I had lost my job. I was trying to sell my prior year's crop of baskets. And uh, a woman, Mary Woodrum, down at the packet shop, the first shop in Old South Wharf, uh, said to me, would you like to come into the shop and work? Uh, you know, sell your baskets next year. So I was on unemployment. I used the time to build up an inventory of baskets and sat there, you know, came in, sold that summer. And I made just about as much money as I would have at General Electric. And uh, so it was, it was interesting. I think I was, for an 8-inch basket, I think I was selling for $250. And if you look at the, the Reyes, the Paul Whitten, and the back of the prices are, what, $40, $50 for, it's, it's funny. So that's how my father got into it and how I got into it. And it was, you know, what, he learned the basics, so what his interpretations, you know, we, we nail every rib, as I said, this oak rib top, oak rib bottom, and... Uh, little doodads on the bottom. Well, yeah, but that, that came later, the little discussion pins on the bottom. But it's... Uh, and you call them ribs, not staves. Yeah, I call them ribs. And you nail every rib, every... Yeah, every rib. Um, number actually, Reyes nailed every rib. You just can't see it. If you take off a Reyes rim, the outer rim, he has little tacks that are on every rib. That every rib that isn't um, got a nail going all the way through. Which is, you know, it surprised me the first time I saw it. Another thing that you'll find with a Reyes basket that you don't really realize is some of the old ones. They'll have a handle on them, but if you turn it upside down and look where the handle goes, it'll have sh it'll have uh, leather, which indicates it had a shoulder strap at one time on it, and that's kind of fascinating too because shoulder straps disappeared totally for a long, long time, and then um, I started bringing them back because women would come in and they'd say, "Oh, I don't want to walk around like this," you know. All right, it's uncomfortable or whatever. And so I, I started doing some shoulder straps and then the kidneys came along. And uh, the kidneys were, you know, nice innovation. Because these, these baskets, if you put a shoulder strap on this, as you all know, you know, they just roll. Yeah. And a kidney, a kidney still will move around a little, but it, it really sets up there a lot better. Oh, there goes part of my audience. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, bye bye, hon. This one's being kind of. Yeah. Uh, the little one, not the big one. Oh. <laughs> the. Uh, so that was, that was kind of fun, I think, when, the, when those shoulder straps came along, because uh, it, it opened up a new segment of the market that, uh, you know, we really hadn't touched before. Yeah, the kidney is nice. Yeah. So did you start the kidney? No, no, uh, Glenn Ann actually did. Um, what was her name? Glenn Ann? Elliot. 
Elliot, yeah. But she you had the. This, didn't you? Well, yeah, but that's just a variation on a theme, kind okay. of. Yeah. Um, Glenn Ann came with the shoulder strap and on the kidney, and the, they were made by the Andersons. Mm -hmm. And uh, then she tried the what? Excuse me, angered everybody. I was going to say something else, but <laughs> angered everybody was was the fact that uh, she tried to get a patent on it. And I don't know whether she actually did or whatever, but she did yeah, but but she she was throwing her weight around and so on and trying to curtail everybody. So uh, our our original, my uh, my father made the first one he did was basically took the seven inch oval. This is an eight inch, but he took the mold or the outline and just put a little indentation back there, which was all right for seven inch. And then when I came along, and wanted to increase the size of the basket. This is Judy's. That's very nice. Who did the scrimshaw? David Lazarus. Uh, very nice. Uh, I had a couple of things that I wanted to do. I wanted as much curve as possible, and I wanted to limit the width so that it would sit better on the, on the hip, not stick out too much. And I wanted the opportunity to make it as deep as possible because you really got to have some depth to it because of the indentations in this. And I, I really wasn't looking forward to uh, cell phones and everything else that we have now. But I was, I was trying to, people doing vertical stuff, placing vertical stuff in their basket rather than, you know, horizontal piling that, that usually went along with that. And over the years, I've seen some baskets that are piled full of stuff. That's <laughs> ridiculous. What you women carry. <laughs> why, don't, why don't you show the, the, the one that uh, Kathy brought in for me? Because that's, that's oh, this a, this really is, an early basket. Really. This, this is a darling little basket. Is, uh, oh. It has a uh, Larry Veneau scrimshaw. And it's uh, one of mine. Has it got a date on it? 74. 74? 74? 74, that's why I want, yeah, look at it, take a look. Wow. Oh. See, a Larry stick there, let's see. No, it, it has no date on oh, it. Oh, that did, on no. my phone. Because no. 74 was way, that was when I was first starting. Oh, this is, Beauty. that's a gorgeous little basket. Yeah. When did you stop using the chains? Um, the chains, this, this was uh, something my father invented. It's really a, a sterling chain held on with like a little horseshoe of, of sterling silver that is there. And when most people, instead of, instead of pushing with your thumb out, most people, when they first get their basket, it's tight and they start wiggling it and all of a sudden, boom, and you're adding the weight of your hand going this direction on a sterling chain, and they would break. And the next summer I'd have them come in and the chain would be dangling and I'd have to replace it, I'd have to replace it. So I got uh, Mike Bedell. I don't know if anybody remembers Mike. Oh, do you? Yeah. He came in. I think he learned from his dad too, or his grandfather. He, he came in and we were talking about baskets <clears throat> and he had a string on his basket and I had tried to do string but the best I could come up with was just a piece of string, wrap it around, tie a knot in it. And I said, Mike, how are you doing your, your strings? And a couple days later he comes walking in with a, a drill, string, eye rings and he shows me how to, you take the string, I don't know, I, I don't know if you, anybody does their own strings here, but he would, he tied the string, had little hooks and an eye ring, and he stood back and he squeezed the, his drill and went, and it tightened it up, and then he took it off and doubled it over and then went the opposite direction. and. When, when the dust settled, basically, you had this, 
um, you know, it was wound, it looks, it looks very nice. And it had a loop at the end that you could slide the, the pin through and then tied it off with a, another little piece of, and then super glued the, the knots. And from then on, I had something that wasn't, it was way more durable than this. It, it uh, you know, the sterling was just ridiculous, but it looked nice. Although, right now, this doesn't look that good. That looks good. Look, look how. It needs to be polished. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 But, so, that's uh, little tricks. Yes? So, in what ways, if any, besides, I guess, the string versus the sterling, do you differ from your dad's uh, method? He he made a much better basket than I do. <laughs> he he could really you know when he was setting up a basket, it was meticulous. It was like a machine. You know all the spaces were fabulous. He didn't really use that. I I probably make a, a finer rib than he did, but uh, you know he he was just. But he was doing it as a retired person, killing time more or less, making a few bucks off it, and uh, as a hobby. Whereas, you know, I get X number of baskets a year that I have to make, and, and it's, it's um, it, uh, I, what can I say? <laughs> and how long does it take you on average to make a basket? Sure varies with size, but well, I used to make them a lot quicker when I had four kids, and you still have four kids. <laughs> I know it, but they're all, they're all independent. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, I, I it, it, I'm usually working on two baskets: one that I'm finishing and one that's coming in. And I, I usually tell customers 25 to 30 hours, and that's spread out over a week because you have your drying time and your finishes. And uh, you know, air like this is ridiculous for trying to do a finish. And then you've got calving, and you know everybody. Everybody thinks that once you weave it, that's basically the end of the thing. And everybody here knows that, uh, you know, you're not even halfway done. Right. You got to make the the uh, latches. You got to do all your finishes and fit the handle and so on and so forth. So, but yeah, my my father made a. Beautiful, beautiful basket. And he did his own carving too. He, uh, because he was an outsider in the basket community, that nobody would carve for him really. So he would, uh, he started carving. He bought himself a elephant tusk. I don't know for how much money, but uh, you know, probably, probably less than ten dollars a pound. And then at one point. He went out to Urbana, Illinois. He had heard about some elephant tusks. I don't know whether it had something to do with the University of Chicago or just what, but he went out to, he flew out to Urbana, Illinois, and he bought like 20 tusks and then came home with them. So, I didn't know that. Yeah. He, he, I still have some of that stuff, as a matter of fact. And, uh, his carvings were beautiful. Yeah, he did. He did a good job. But he was—he was, of course, he was. You know, he was a good carver. He was a good basic carver, but he wasn't the carver that Nancy oh, right. was. You know, Nancy is just fabulous carver. Oh, my goodness! If anybody has ever been in her shop, it's just. Did I tell him a story about how um, somebody sold a, ba a, a silver basket to? Uh, Scott, remember she did she did the lobster. Oh yeah, yeah. I had I, I had a customer that she bought a, a seven inch solid ivory top, and she took it to Nancy to do a carving. Next year she came in, and she literally had a lobster, a full lobster with the antenna and the little feet that Nancy had copped. It was absolutely incredible. It was... Yeah, two, 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 
two I, uh, yeah, no, two pieces, so one yeah. piece broke. I, I, have to do the other piece I, 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 I didn't realize that. You, you have more information than I do, but, but it, uh, I just looked at it, and the, the tentacles, so, you know, the two little, yeah. they were there. And I looked at it, and I thought, it's impossible to carry this basket. I, I remember Nancy said that. She'd never do another one. She said she'd never, you know? she did it, she'd never do another one. You know? Right? It was, it, was it, was, unbelievable. Uh, it was unbelievable. It's, it's really, I understand the plight of the elephant and everything, but some of the stuff that, you know, the, the, the clusters of shells that they used to do, that it looked like somebody grabbed it and threw it on top of the basket. It was just fabulous stuff. Nancy used to do the cluster of shells, and then she'd have a little hermit crab, and the claws would be holding a little teeny island. Did anybody, everybody ever see that? But, and the scrim shanders that, that are, you know, when I first got here, there had to be 30 or 40 scrim shanders at different levels. Maybe not that, maybe I'm exaggerating a little, but I'm, I'm thinking that, let me th rewind a little on that. In the 60s, when I first started business, there used to be probably, uh, I bet you 30 different scrim shanders, you know, making jewelry and, kids that had come from college and boy and now it's just Michael Vanell Leanne I think is out of it isn't she yeah. uh, Dorothy Vieira used to do it I don't think she does Lazarus is mostly into pain. yeah yeah Lazarus is he'll mostly into pain. Little. he'll do a little exactly. yeah. right. and uh, I've got I've got a lady in Connecticut that's excellent and Brian Kierkoff in Connecticut uh, no I, I mean Rhode Island Barbara Cullen and uh, Brian Kierkoff, they're excellent scrim shanders. I had, oh, this is, this is a, a Barbara. This is um, actually my, should I tell them the story? Yeah, it's funny, but yeah, go ahead. Uh, my father-in-law, Betsy's father, had done a portrait of her at 19. Betsy had sat for her, it was in profile. And so I said to Barbara, because I always wanted to do this, and I said to Barbara, I'm going to take a picture of Betsy, of the, of the portrait, portrait, and then just put a mermaid's body on it. It's not my body. <laughs> so, so, so that's, that's what we ended up with. It's, She'll be inside. And then I had her do the back of the mermaid. Wow. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. No, he's in basket. So it, uh, you know, again, this, the scrimshin, Michael does a fabulous job. He's been doing it forever. He was in the shop with me for, for a long time. His brother Larry, who did that um, piece, was in the shop with me for a while. Larry was an artist. I always found scrimshanders to be you know, if if they were really, really good, they were artists, and artists can't, they hate to do the same thing over and over again. The, when, when we came up with the idea, I don't know if we originated it, but when we came up with the idea of a basket full of wildflowers, it, you know, Larry, we could probably do 15 a year, Larry wouldn't do them. And then it was easy money for him, he just, he just wouldn't do them. It was, it was incredible. But Michael would do it. Yeah, Michael has got more of a business. He realizes that that puts bread on the table. But no, the, this, this, the whole way that the baskets have gone. And, you know, I, I, I once made uh, a basket that I thought was really cool. And it sat and sat and sat because it wasn't the traditional basket. And, and I thought it would sell like that, but it wasn't the traditional basket. So I've, since then, I've basically stuck to what, what sells and what is a traditional basket. I saw the, the poster, you know, with that hot shaped basket on it, beautiful, very clever with the uh, uh, arrow going through with the, in the, but, and today you'd probably sell one, but uh, or, or a few. But it's again, you know, these these are easy to easier to make. I know how to make them. You don't have to, you know. 
Yes. Maybe led me right into the question I was thinking about, which is, I guess, what's your favorite basket or purse to make? And I guess I'm going to say it with the aspect of if the market wasn't an object, because you're, you know, I know you're making to sell, yeah, of course, but uh, if you could make anything, would you rather I, make a round one? Would you rather make a um, good purse? I, I like to kind of get challenged a little when somebody comes in with an idea that, that they'd like made into a basket. That's always fun because there's a mental thing going on. How are you going to shape it? You know, you've got to make the mold. If it's a new shape, you've got to make the mold. You've got to make the rim mold. You've got to make the handle mold. So, you know, there's a bunch of things that go through your mind that, that you have to think about before you actually make the basket. Um, oh, I, I use. Well, wait. Okay. <laughs> I don't want to that that I would not like to make. <laughs> no, we we. Uh, okay, yes. oh, Sounds like a good story too. I, I, I custom. I, I used to make picnic baskets, and it was well like that and that, and probably this deep. Just an incredible amount of work, and. I didn't, I think I made three of them, but they, they were just huge, bulky. It's hard to keep them on your lap. I, I'm a lap we, weaver. I, I hold on my lap and I pull and I pull down like this. I don't know, I, I don't know, some people go up with their thumbs. I don't know exactly how everybody does it, but, uh, and if I, if I, uh, screw up and I go the other direction. It takes me forever because it's I in uh, uh, on my nest. My littlest basket is that big, and sometimes when I do it, I mess up and I do it the opposite way. And it's it's only about that much weaving, and the basket's about that. The mold is about that big around. It's just if I go in the opposite direction, it just screws me up totally. Anyways, back to your question. Uh, my least. <laughs> I don't like to make um, these as much because of the concave. That's a little tough to weave. Um, the I think I'd probably like this basket the most. I've probably made the most of these in my days. It's just an eight inch standard. I tell everybody, this is probably my average basket. People come in, oh, sh show me. Uh, you know, this is what I'll point to if they're interested in a basket, what the prices are. Uh, and Do you still like nests? Yes. I, I want to make a nest or a couple nests for next year. I make a 10 basket nest, and uh, which is one larger than this. And three smaller. Can you hold it up? So I have an eight basket nest that you made. Oh. And it would have been in the early nineties. Okay. Uh, so what, I, you know, I'm looking at that and saying, what what ones do I not have? Do I? Have? Well, you probably don't have the you probably don't have the uh, the outer one and the inner one. Okay. I would guess. Okay. Yeah, I'm just yeah early nineties. Yeah, must have made an eight basket nest, and then yeah. Well, I it, it would would you have bought ever a, a full nine basket nest at the time? You know, were you? Oh, you would have bought whatever was was yeah. there. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I, I was on your list for a couple of maybe two three years. I come in, you gave me a card with the price, and said, and then yeah. said it'll be three to five, and it was say three. And actually, you called me up. And this is kind of funny because it was um, about the end of March. Okay. You called me up, and and I said, oh, and you said you had a nest, and um, that was available. And I said, oh, I'm surprised that I'm up on the list already. I'm up already. And, and you said, well, do you want? It? And yeah, do you want it? And oh, the reason you're I'm up already is because you called a couple of people. And they didn't have the money because they had to pay their income tax. <laughs> <laughs> and you said, and I really need you to pay for it like right away because I have to pay mine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> that happens. But yeah, that's what I. And that's why I know what time. It, yeah, yeah. When it was. Well, I. It was like we're coming up I, to the beginning of April, and everybody's got to move money. Yeah, exactly. I always, I always do uh, covered baskets up to Christmas, and then I stop my open baskets after Christmas. I do uh, whatever I have usually January into February. So, you know, and. Every once in a while, it hasn't been for a while, but every once in a while, I'll, if I do nests for some reason, if you get into a rhythm, and it, it's one of those things. If, if I start doing six of these, let's say, and I, and I start making all the bottoms and this and this and the, you know, for some reason, it doesn't work as well, but if I do a couple of nests, the, the pre-doing everything, because you, you've got to do all the rims. You know, I cut down a tree, obviously, and, and shape, and bend, and dry the, the rims, and the handles, and all the oak. If I, if I start bulking them together, it, it really works well. And I can, I can very efficiently do, like, three nests in like a month, month and a half. But if I, tr if the same thing here, it, I just get bogged down with stuff that you, you know. And turning the bottoms, you know, if you got a lathe and you're turning the bottom, once you get the diameter, you know, where the stop is, and it's easy to t turn the bottoms. So if you're doing one, after you get the first one, you can get everything else. You know, you can do five, six of those very, very easily. So, did I answer? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's my favorite. <laughs> so I assume at one point you had, you, you would make them to sell them now, I'm assuming everything is custom ordered, people come in, yeah. and they yeah. say this is what I want, and it, so at that point, the, you wish you had more control over, you know, artistically what you were doing and selling, or do you feel like well, the, we're in the same baskets over and over again? Yeah, that's, that's basically what. You know, I go I, where I go to get wood. I've got so much wood that I bought over the Jenny knows. Um, I got so much wood. I, I go to this you know wood, or wood workers wood, wood craft, and they get some beautiful wood in, and I I buy and I buy, but everybody wants ebony rosewood. Uh, the the maples, yeah, French the, the, the French quilted maple, bird's eye maple, French walnut. you know, the, yeah. they're blondie woods. They they work, but uh, French French walnut or claro is beautiful wood. Uh, the molly is a, is a beautiful wood, and you know I buy these pieces of wood and I put them aside, but I don't have any orders for them. Yeah, and I, I'm almost I'm almost wishing that I could break the cycle and just make the baskets I want to do, put them, in the, put them on the shelf, and then sell them. Because it, it from a, then I don't have to chase people for money and yada, yada, yada. Yeah. Even if it isn't tax time. <laughs> We've started seeing a lot more Hollywood. That's for the knobs? For the, the knobs white, or yeah. just for bases? Yeah. I, I'm unfamiliar with that. I wouldn't. Uh, that's a white wood, isn't it? Very white. Yeah. I, the, the problem with that, to me, is you you pick up dirt and usage of the basket, and with a white wood, it really shows. The uh, I know. I I used to put the maples on the bottom. It's a nice dark. It's a nice uh, dense wood. It's it's strong, but you know it'll it'll show the scratches and the dirt and so on. So, it, you know, I, I just haven't used it. And I probably would hesitate to use it for, the, for a bottom. For a bottom, yeah. For that reason. I always, for a long time, I was trying to match the tops and the bottoms of a basket. But if I'm using, I'm trying to think of a softwood. Um, well, a black walnut's a fairly softwood. If, if I'm using black walnut, I, I wouldn't necessarily use it on the bottom because of the strength of the wood. And uh, that kind of brings me to uh, damage, because I'm repairing. 
it, it uh, the damages I've seen over the years. I've I've uh, I've had a woman that took her basket, put it up in the her closet. Unbeknownst to her, she had put it against the light bulb, and came in the next year with a burn spot. And another woman was at a wedding, and you know the table got crowded. She had her basket in the middle, and there was a little candle burn. Another another woman came in. Puppies used to be hell on baskets. They would they would start chewing on, on a rim and stuff. It, it was just incredible. Uh, cat was flossing its teeth with the peg, you know, the string on the peg. Uh, it, it's been interesting. We I, our friend uh, at home. She uh, there had been an accident out in front of the house and. She put her basket down. It was an open basket. She put her basket down next to her door and went to look at the the, the tree. It, it wasn't nobody got hurt bad or anything. But her husband didn't know the basket was. He starts backing up and he felt himself going up on a basket, and luckily he rolled off. It was an open basket, and all he did was get out, punch it out, and uh, you know. And uh, well, the last one was a woman was going someplace in their convertible, and she threw the her, put her basket in where the soft top comes down. Husband put the top down. <laughs> so it's uh, if you know if you use the right finish, and I always tell people to use shellac, you can fix most anything that happens in a basket. If you do polyurethane, it's awful tough. It, uh, you know, it's, it makes the basket strong. I'd much rather fix a Reyes basket than a Gibbs basket, for example. Gibbs is just, you know, they're, they're well made. They last forever. But also, the ivory front piece is, you know, it looks nice, but it, you know, it's got grain in it. And, that can break, and then you're into trying to fit the eye, uh, replacement. And you got to cut the rim away and lift it up, and it's you know there's some good and some bad. Yeah. Jerry, why did you sign yours on the inside? Because I saw signatures wear off on the bottom, so I figured it would be better to get filled with gum, lipstick. <laughs> You know that type of stuff. Then, yeah. And I don't have good handwriting, so. And this, this is really, you know, people that know this is our signature. So they'll, I'll, I'll, I'll have people come in, and they'll go, oh, I was such and such, and somebody came up, or I saw one of your baskets because of the handle. And I used to get I, that reminds me of a story I, that the woman came in and and she was carrying her basket in. The subway in in Paris, she said, and and uh, there was a crowd on the subway, and she spotted uh, way down the way uh, a, a woman carrying a light chip basket, and she tried to get to the woman to say hello to her, but she couldn't because of the crowd. So she just lifted up, raised the basket above her head, and said, yelled Nantucket, <coughs> and the woman that was carrying the other basket. We oui, Nantucket. <laughs> so, so, yeah, that was great. It, uh, the the stories that you hear, the feedback that you get from customers is very interesting. What's funny is uh, a lot of times my kids have their baskets and they'll be going places, and all of a sudden Jenny or Keen or somebody will go up and go, or Julie, and they'll say. That's a Jerry Brown basket. You've got my dad's basket, yeah. and uh, you know yeah. they, they go. That's your dad. You know, it's it, you always run into people with it. It I uh, the basket usage here has has kind of dwindled. They, I think they've become more of a collectible decorative item than a actually functional item that that people are using every day, which I think is kind of a shame because they are they are totally functional. And they can be repaired, and they look better with usage. You know, the, the, these 
well, you know, Judy's basket, Betsy's basket, you know, they look, oh, I got, I got, a, I, I heard this story once. I'm changing the subject. Uh, Reyes had, had made a basket for a woman, and she came in and picked it up, and she looked at it, and she goes, oh, it's got a dark stripe on it. I, I don't know as I like that. I, you know, I'd want it all uniform. And as we all know, there's probably, what, 20 or more different strands that it, all of them are going to age differently in, a, in, a, in the body of a basket. And uh, Reyes, quick thinker, he says, I did that on purpose. <laughs> if you're at a cocktail party and somebody starts to steal your basket or pick it up by mistake, you'll be able to recognize it by the stripe. <laughs> so, yeah. I used to tell people, because I don't do the best job of getting the hairs off it, that it's an old Nantucket tradition to, every time you pluck one off, make a wish. <laughs> so, <laughs> anyways. That is perfect. I kind of think maybe that's where we finish unless any questions? Questions. I have a question. So you do all the um, the basket making, plus you do the carving, uh, the quarter board, and then you also do the carving. We do the nice. quarter board and some of the carving. Okay. Um, I do simple carvings. Uh, I like to think of it as cookie cutter carvings. You know, as long as I can get the shape, then it's. I'm not a, a great carving. The, there's a lot of carvings today that are very elegant that are done on mammoth or mastodon, whatever you want to call it. They come in from Malaysia. Mm -hmm. And there's a guy that buys uh, mammoth tusk in Alaska, takes it to Malaysia. They do the carving, and they, then he can get it into the country because it's not elephant ivory. And uh, then we can sell it. Well, hopefully we'll be able to sell it. Uh, and it's just fabulous detail. You know, he does, he does turtles that they're done on both sides, and they look exactly alike, so I think there's probably a machine involved. But, uh, you know, it's, it, they are good. Mm. Well, thank you. Jenny Cavs. Jenny Cavs, right there. Yeah. She's excellent. Yeah, she's like a father. Yeah. Ridiculous. Jenny went to art school. <laughs> well, thank you, Jerry. Thank you. Thank you, thank you all for coming. Thank you for coming. I invite everyone to visit the Brown family's case, which is a really large, full one, mm -hmm. in the other room. And um, right behind it is actually a case with one of Jenny's baskets. Great. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.